uh, we're very happy to come over and um, have this educational session today. Um, I'm going to try to talk about what is uh, related to acute stroke management. And my colleagues on the back are going to go into all the topics, um, ICA, thrombectomy, uh, FAST. So we're hoping to have a great morning with you here. Uh, I'm sure that's going to happen. And so let's get started. Um, I have no disclosure um, to share with you. Uh, we're going to start with the objectives. Um, we're going to go over an overview, um, look at some of the statistics for stroke, and talk about acute management of a stroke patients. Starting in the pre-hospital setting, EMS, then when the patient arrives to the emergency department. Uh, after that, um, we're going to see different management, where we were, where we're going, and probably what is going to be the future. Um, treatment while the patient is on the ward, and, and some of the stroke units using the guidelines, the most recent guidelines from the American Stroke Association um, that were brought up in 2018 and revised in March, and some features of critical care. So talking about stroke, it's important to know two different types of stroke, ischemic stroke versus hemorrhagic stroke. Ischemic stroke, when there is a lack of blood flow, an occlusion or obstruction of a large vessel, and that ends up giving you this appearance on the scanner, a hypodensity black spot in the head CT. The hemorrhagic stroke, on the opposite is more of a burst of a vessel and <coughs> that's translated as a hyperdensity on the scanner. Stroke, we have about 800,000 people having a stroke a year. That's a significant amount. From that, you have to know that every 40 seconds somebody is having a stroke it may be dying from a stroke every three minutes and 45 seconds. Stroke is a major disability, um, long-term disability worldwide. There are about 12% of patients in 2015 that um, had a stroke, and that put a stroke diagnosis as the second leading cause of death behind uh, heart disease although is the fifth cause of death in the United States. Uh, so we have made a lot of progress. And if we talk really um, from a stroke perspective, we always bring up that time is in essence. Time is brain, and time lost is brain lost. Why do I say that? I do say that because when you have a patient who has a blockage in a large vessel, there are so many neurons and synapses that are lost. If you want to take a guess, anybody knows what is the right answer in there? The right answer is about 1.9, almost 2 million neurons lost per minute with 14 billion synapses per minute. So when somebody tells me, why do you act fast? and you run when you have a patient with a stroke? Because if I was on that table, and I was on that scenario, I wouldn't like to be losing two million neurons per minute. So we need to act really fast. That's very important. So, but let's go back a little bit in history and talk about where everything started, the history of a stroke and the history of the new management of stroke patients. Um, in 1995, uh, the National Institute of Neurological Disorder published the NEANS trial. That was the pivotal study that moved us into acute stroke management. And that was using IVTPA for patients with acute stroke symptoms. Later on, there were some other um, 
um, studies and, and coalition and committees like the Brain Attack Coalition in 2000 that started to promote primary stroke centers to give TPA within 60 minutes. It was still kind of early, but they were trying to promote that from happening. And then there was the STAR study um, that included patients from community academic centers. They noticed that they were administering the TPA within 96 minutes. So that was too long for patients having acute stroke. And referring to the stroke guidelines, now we think the stroke guidelines from 2013 are old. But back then, as you see when a patient was coming with a stroke, usually they check uh, blood sugar, getting the patient to the scanner, having labs drawn while the patient was still on the scanner, and doing the whole workup to make sure that that patient qualified for TPA. The most important thing to know if that patient was going to go um, for IV TPA, it was to do an emergent uh, brain MRI image. And that included a non-contrast head CT and also CT angiogram of head and neck. Why? Because we wanted to make sure that we were not dealing with a large stroke causing already changes on a scanner because that would put the patient at risk, at increased risk of hemorrhage. So to give thrombolytic therapy go now and then besides the lab was to have a negative HCT. Hemorrhage is a total absolute contraindication to give IV TPA. Now talking in regards to the sequence, how the patient arrives to the hospital and get to our hands. Um, Pre-hospital care is uh, basic and one of the most important issues that we have to be focusing in. The goal is to try to determine that that patient is having a stroke symptoms and try to facilitate the treatment as quickly as possible. So EMS the emergency medicine services are an important part during this process. Why? Because EMS would be the first contact between patient, family, and then would be that liaison with the hospital medicine, the ED physicians, and the whole staff. So recognition of a stroke symptoms by the patient and their family is very important. We need to educate our patients about recognizing stroke symptoms. How to call quickly 911 rather than taking their car and bringing them in, walking, because as soon as the EMS get to that patient, the treatment starts, okay? So that's really important to empathize. And then from an EMS perspective, dispatching that EMS as a priority is also very important in that process. So the patient gets evaluated by EMS, treated on the field, including ABC, and also giving that patient an aspirin immediately. That could be life-saving. Advanced notification to, to the hospital to let them know we're bringing you in a stroke patient so the team gets ready and prepared to move forward. While the patient gets to the emergency department, immediately we have the ED triage, evaluation by the physicians, um, and then the pathway may divert. It may go to, is this patient having an ischemic stroke versus this patient is having a hemorrhagic stroke. If the patient is having an ischemic stroke, a quick decision, um, informed decision to try to initiate uh, thrombolytic therapy. And then the dispo from the ED. I want to bring to your attention a study that was done in Europe and was one of the first one um, to try to categorize and analyze the process for those patients who were having, who were having a stroke. What they did, that was the European Helsinki study, they studied about 2,000 patients and they followed them from 1995 till 2011. 
uh, what they were focusing in, this was a retrospective study, but it was a cohort study. Uh, what they did is they noticed that the time, the door to needle time for patients receiving acute stroke care was about 105 minutes. So over the years, and I'm going to show you next a table of what they did, over the course of the years since 1995, they dropped that door to needle time from 105 to 60 minutes in 2003 and to 20 minutes by the end of 2011. That's really remarkable. So these were the 12 measures that they started. And you see it by year, how they started in 1998. So they planned about 1995. They started really formally in 1998. The EMS involvement was a key piece in the process. Education of the EMS personnel and having a high priority dispatch for those patients. Then they move into the hospital pre-notification, like about three years later. They started to figure that out, how to make and expedite that process. Uh, to get to a 20 minute door to needle time, you have to be, have a lot of information pre-hospital arrival to try to keep moving those um, treatment. Um, also pre-ordering tests before the patient arrives to the hospital. Um, no delays in CT interpretation. The CTs were looked by stroke neurologists and they did not wait for a radiology report to come in. Uh, Pre-mixing the TPA even before the patient arrived, so the EMS were able to identify that those patients would qualify for TPA most likely based on their scale, stroke scale, that they use at the field when they initially saw the patient. And then delivering the TPA at the table, at the CT table, giving just the bolus while the patient is still on the scan. If we knew that the CAT scan uh, was negative, then giving that bolus immediately. Um, they, in 2003, they relocated the CT. That was a major step, relocating the CT at the ER, um, in the ER area, and then transferring the patient immediately and not having anybody on that table. So by the time that that patient arrived, everything was already set up. Um, they skip and did only point of care INR to make sure that that patient did not have a coagulopathy or contraindication for TPA. And then reducing the amount of imaging because back in those days, they probably did not have you know, they did not have what we have now, high technology, rapid CT perfusions or things like that. So they try to minimize, just concentrate on a non-con head CT. But times have evolved. In this graph, you're going to see how mo the vast majority of their patients, about 94% of their patients, they receive TPA within 60 minutes. 50% within 20 minutes, about 72% within 30 minutes, and then the majority was within 60 minutes, if you can see. Um, advanced imaging was one of the categories, as I said, that uh, they try to avoid because they saw an increase in the time of um, treatment or delay in treatment. And then in 2008, you see a slight decline or a drop, uh, an increased time in the time to onset to treatment. And that correlated to the ECAS uh, trial when it came out, when the window for IVTPA was expanded from three hour window to four and a half. Um, and then you would see the two arms um, going away from each other, but that, has, that was related to the uh, time window expansion. So what happened on this side of the world? What was happening in the United States, it was this, this target stroke initiative that was the initial phase. I'm not going to show you uh, the video in regards to um, that initiative. 
but I encourage everybody to go to the AHA. It's a very interesting video how things can be expedited, uh, the coordination among the teams, the preparation in the hospital, having everybody in place um, to get and receive those patients and give them the treatment at the right time. You know, so they say time flies, and boy does it. We at the Target Stroke National Quality Improvement Initiative sure think so. We've focused on improving acute ischemic stroke care and outcomes for eligible stroke patients treated with Alteplase. How are we going to do it? Simple, by reducing the door to needle time for every eligible stroke patient. The goals for phase two are to reduce those daunting door to needle times to within 60 minutes and eventually down to within 45 minutes. But don't worry, during the video, we'll review the 12 key strategies to help us get there. Are you ready? Let's get started. So you wanna know what matters most when someone suffers a stroke? The answer is simple, time. No, seriously, every second matters. We have a little saying with regard to stroke treatment, time is brain. Cute, right? But really, it's no laughing matter. Every second wasted increases the risk of irreparable brain damage. No pressure, right? Thankfully, we've developed 12 key strategies that will help you save time and drastically affect your patient's recovery and peace of mind. You see what I did there? <laughs> anyway, they say time waits for no one, so let's begin. Key number one, emergency responders should immediately pre-notify the hospital when a stroke is recognized. This early warning means the hospital staff is ready to spring into action, reducing the time to get the patient to brain imaging and ensuring the availability of intravenous alteplase. Say that three times fast. Key number two, a stroke toolkit should be used for each patient. It's like a cheat sheet. The patient gets the proper care and the attending physician has all the help he or she can get. Everybody wins. Key number three, quick response triage procedures lead to earlier recognition of strokes and reduce time to treatment. Remember, we're counting seconds here, so mobilize your stroke team as soon as you receive a pre-notification or a stroke patient is identified. Stat. Key number four, implement a system where the entire stroke team can be activated with a single call. This single call system should include the reservation of a scanner for brain imaging. Still with me? Good, just checking. I know it's a lot of information, but the clock is ticking. We better hustle. Key number five, attach a timer or clock to patient's chart, clipboard, or bed. A universal clock allows healthcare providers to accurately evaluate the patient. Tick, 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 tick. Key number six, if appropriate, transfer the patient directly from the triage area to the CT scanner for neuro exam and brain imaging. The sooner the better. Key number seven, perform the CT scan or MRI within 25 minutes of patient's arrival and complete a full assessment of the scan within 45 minutes. Key number eight, lab results should be available no later than 30 minutes after patient's arrival. It's a fast-paced world. Everyone wants everything right now, and we're no exception. So if standard lab times are too slow, use alternate point-of-care testing for faster results. Ugh, we've still got more to learn, but we're running out of time. <sighs> we better hurry. Key number nine, mix the alteplase ahead of time. Prepare the bolus dose and one-hour infusion pump as soon as the patient is identified as a candidate. Just FYI, the drug manufacturer will replace mixed but unused medication in time critical situations, so preparing the drugs ahead of time can only help. There's virtually no downside. Key number 10, as soon as the patient is deemed eligible, administer the Alteplase IV. The initial dosage should be given while the patient is on the CT table. Keep dosing charts and standardized order sets handy as they can speed up the process and reduce the risk of errors. Cheat sheets again, gotta love them. Key number 11, put your heads together. A team-based approach to stroke treatment can increase efficiency and care. Form a diverse team to review the hospital's processes and results. Key number 12, accurately measure and track performance times in stroke response and treatment. You won't be able to improve if you don't establish a baseline. Identify areas for improvement and then take action. Finally, include a process for prompt feedback to improve common practices. Tick, 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 and done. Whew. Not bad. Not bad at all. Now, that was just an overview of the 12 strategies. For more detailed information, reference the full document at the URL below where you can really wrap your head around the specifics. Well, it seems we're out of time. Just remember, preparation is key. Your patients are depending on you. But don't worry, they're in good hands. The right time. So what they studied was to see if giving 
IVTPA in a timely manner um, in analyzing patients from 2003 to 2009 um, and seeing what was happening for those patients not receiving IVTPA. When they came in to the conclusion uh, that fewer than a third of the patients were receiving IVTPA within 60 minutes. So that was a striking um, information. Um, they encouraged, they, they also noticed that there was a disparity. There was a vast majority of the patients that were male, they were white, they were younger for those who were receiving TPA less than 60 minutes. So they try to correct that um, in order to improve their outcome. And they decided, well, we have to do, we have to target certain measures, certain issues in this process so we can get the patients IV TPA within 60 minutes because that's going to be a determinant um, for their 90 days and one year functional outcome. So those patients were going to be better in terms of their functionality when they were um, evaluated by a modified ranking scale um, at three months from the TPA administration. A quality assessment of practice was also <laughs> conducted and um, what they came up was with these five domains, they analyzed uh, hospitals that were performing the best and those that were not performing that well. They try to share best practices. Um, and they came up with a domain of communication and teamwork, those that performed the best. There was a lot of communication and involvement even beyond the time of the treatment. The process they had uh, was they had explicit uh, policies in place. The organizational culture, um, everybody, the staff was supported by the administration and vice versa. Uh, the performance in monitoring and giving feedback to the staff that was participating in the care of that patient was really important to motivate uh, the staff and everybody to be engaged. And also overcoming some barriers, um, like to try to identify the barriers and um, try to resolve the problems as they would present. So. After all that analysis was done, then it came out that there was a big research project um, coming in to, to see all of those things that we just discussed. And um, in 2014, um, there was this group that tried to compare before the point, the initiative, was started really to track where the problem was and solve it, um, and then afterwards. So 2003 to 2009, and then 2010 until 2012. The key issue here was the target initiative was initiated in 2010, and what happened was that patients that were getting TPA within 105 minutes after that target initiative was started, the number, the, the, the timing to receive TPA dropped down to 59 minutes. So something was working. They were, they were finding the reasons why the patients were not getting TPA and then um, they were having all of these hospitals uh, creating process in their system to try to improve that timing. They also noticed that um, the complication symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage at 36 hours also decreased. Uh, the TPA complications decreased. In hospital, all cause of mortality also um, decreased. And the likelihood of those patients going to home or to a nursing 
not to a nursing home, but a skilled nursing facility was higher than those that were just placed comfort care. What is new is um, the phase two um, of the target initiative when um, now they're trying to have all of the hospitals get patients not only within 60 minutes, at least 75 to 80 percent of the cases, but um, to have them within 45 minutes for at least 50 percent of the cases. So that is coming and um, there are some um, hospitals that are trying to promote that we should give IVTPA uh, within 30 minutes. So um, now starting in 2015, the hospital get rewarded with certain um, roles, honor roles level, um, and probably, and I'm pretty sure um, Kitty Taz, I think has an honor role, um, uh, very impressive. So what is the, um, the goal for those timing? We need to have um, door to physician times within 10 minutes or less. And uh, the CT initiation is about 20 minutes from the time that that patient hits the door. Having an interpretation of the HES-CT by 45 minutes and goal of uh, door to drug in about 80% compliance, less than 60 minutes for sure, and for 45 minutes in 50% of the cases. Uh, so that's, that's the goal. Let's say that the patient gets to the ED, receives the IVTPA, and um, for the nurses, what are the things that you should be watching for? So this is a little checklist that I found it was really interesting. Um, is number one, you guys all know that you need to be performing neuroassessment during the TPA administration, checking the blood pressure regularly every 15 minutes during that one hour of infusion, um, and checking for minor bleeding at the different sites. If the patient during that infusion complains of a severe headache, um, their symptoms like the um, neurological symptoms deteriorate, then that infusion needs to be stopped. Or if the patient is having nausea, vomiting, symptoms of increased intracranial pressure, that infusion needs to be um, stopped. The other symptom that needs to be monitored is the orolingual angioedema. That's a swelling of the tongue because the TPA has an effect on the bradykinin pathway and that can cause angioedema. Uh, after the TPA, it's important to continue to monitor for any type of deterioration and that has to be, you have to be very strict. Every 15 minutes after um, the infusion, then every 30 minutes, uh, during the next six hours, the same thing for your for the blood pressure. Continue to monitor for any minor bleeding at the venipuncture or at the site, um, um, you know, urinary tract. Or uh, and then if that patient doesn't have any complications, then at 24 hours they need to have repeat neuroimaging to make sure that they didn't have any complications for from the IVTPA. And you have to continue to monitor for signs of orolingual angioedema. There is a complication for post-DPA patients that you have to know, and is the symptomatic ICH. That happens between 1.9 to 6.4% of the cases. Most cases are related to reperfusion injury the population basically at risk are elderly, patients with diabetes, hyperglycemia, those do not, that do not have a controlled hypertension. And the orolingual angioedema, although is a rare complication, it can happen. Before, when we were not administering a lot of IVTPA, the risk was thought to be less than 1%. Now we say that it's about one to five percent, so it's something to be watching for. Um, there is a higher risk for orolingual angioedema 
for patients who are taking angiotensin converting enzymes inhibitors. Do we ask or get afraid if somebody's taking it, that ACE inhibitor? No, we don't, we still proceed, but we have to be cautious and keep that in mind. And if the patient shows a sign like this, swelling of the tongue, uh, usually on the same side of the hemiparetic area, then you should think about it and immediately stop the infusion. Um, then you will have to, if the swelling is significant in, in enough, that patient will need to have intubation using, using uh, fiber optic um, intubation. Uh, administration definitely discontinue the IVTPA, giving methylprednisolone and um, Benadryl plus ranitidine. There is a new drug, Icataban. That medication is used for severe cases of angioedema, but their price is prohibited. It costs about $9,000 a vial. So I'm pretty sure the vast majority of the hospitals are not gonna have it. Um, I would recommend to start with our simple algorithm of steroids, uh, Benadryl and ranitidine. And um, if there is a complication of the IVTPA, like a hemorrhage, definitely besides stopping the IVTPA infusion, cryoprecipitate and tranexamic acid besides the neurohospitalist management, neurosurgery and hematology uh, consultations. Those are a must. So where are we now? Now that the patient went to the ED, the patient that we are seeing nowadays more recently, and when I'm talking about, I'm talking after 2013 or for about for the past couple of years or for the past year. We're moving into the evaluation going from fast to be fast and Kelly is going to be talking to you a little bit more about the use of be fast and the importance of using be fast. We have um, new technology coming in, Pulsera, which is a way how to communicate between healthcare providers and the different departments to try to align and keep everybody in the same page, avoid miscommunication. It's a system that is going to alert each step from the patient when it arrives, when the patient is evaluated and you um, document your NIH stroke scale, when that patient has a CAT scan and a CTA, and when that patient qualifies or not for IVTPA. That's a pretty impressive technology favoring um, our patients. Since 2013 or after that, we know that we don't need any more to wait for laboratories to come back. If we have a point creatinine telling us that the INR is 1.7 or less, we can move ahead. We don't need to wait for a kidney function test. There were a couple of articles that um, you know, have been published in 2017. One was in the Stroke Journal um, showing that if we give contrast to patient coming in acute setting, we don't have to worry, they don't have, they didn't show signif statistically significant deterioration in regards to um, AKI or patients, even though for those patients who had chronic kidney disease. So we move forward, give the contrast, and then we take care of the nephrons. The, the nephrologists, they don't like that we say neurons over nephrons, but uh, <laughs> that's how it goes. There is another um, article in 2017, and that was done in an emergency medicine. It's the largest control study um, following contrast administration, they didn't see an increased frequency of acute kidney disease um, after administration of the contrast. Now, what about thrombectomies? 
We're going to have a very specific talk about thrombectomy. Dr. David Robinson is going to go in detail, but I just want to bring a few points that are key uh, for the acute stroke um, management. And it's since 2015 when the guidelines for endovascular therapy were revised. Um, it has been proven that opening a large vessel is much better for the patient than just giving medical therapy alone. It's okay to give the IVTPA, but if that patient has a large vessel occlusion, that patient should go for a thrombectomy without any delay. We're not waiting on timing. We have to move fast. The faster, the better. Don't forget, two million neurons per minute. If it was you or your family member, you would like to have somebody who acts fast, all right? There are two extended treatment windows that were beyond six hours, uh, the SCAPE and Rivas CAT. Um, and th those five trials were, you know, they turn the acute care of a stroke into a new world. So here are the five um, um, trials that were um, that we have from 2015, Mr. Clean, Drevascat, Escape, Swift Prime, and then Extended 1A, couple of those with, the, with an extended time window. Um, and then we come to the conclusion that we still use now TPA within three hour window, within four hour window, but we have the availability of treating patients with a stroke and a large vessel occlusion with uh, thrombectomy within 24 hour windows. And for the posterior circulation, that goes beyond that. That can go beyond the 24 hour. So I don't want anybody saying, well, you know, it's kind of late, we are 20 hours, or if it's a basilar artery thrombosis, oh, we are at the cutoff 23 hours. I just want you to pick up the phone and call and say, is this patient still a candidate to have a thrombectomy done? No delay, just move fast. In 2018, at the International Stroke Conference um, in January, they presented the guidelines from 2018 for acute stroke uh, management. And then um, they really thought that it was an evidence base that the patient going for a thrombectomy should have also IV uh, TPA. That's a combined therapy that we use nowadays. So we start the drip, we ship that patient, we do not delay and move them quickly, right quickly to the table. Um, patients that had uh, pre-stroke um, MRS score zero to one. So before they had the stroke, they probably were functional, somehow independent. So those patients, we can try to keep them as functional as possible after a thrombectomy. And um, the occlusion, what we aim is to see if that patient has a proximal occlusion, whether it is at the level of the internal carotid or the M1 segment. Um, and having an NIH stroke scale, which can be quickly assessed just by looking at the patient. If you see somebody's plegic, you know the score is going to be a little bit high, all right? Uh, and if they can talk, you know that they're globally aphasic, so that increased even more. Uh, so that NIH stroke scale of six or more, um, within the six hour window, um, that qualifies for a patient for thrombectomy. And then um, those w that are within the 6 to 16 hour window or beyond that were studied um, with the Dawn and Diffuse 3 trials. Uh, I'm going to move a little bit quickly here because I want to mention those two trials. The Dawn trial was presented at the European Stroke Conference in 2017. Um, it showed that there is a 35% increase in the number of patients that would achieve a functional um, 
um, in functional independence with a score zero to two. So that was the initial um, publication. It was in November 2017. Uh, patients went for endovascular treatment more than six hours after symptom onset. They had to have a mismatch, which I'm going to show you on one of the slides what a mismatch is. There has to be a penumbra area large enough compared to the core of an infarct, which is the area that we cannot save. Um, and then they stopped the trial because of the um, results. Here are the inclusion exclusion criteria for both. It's pretty much the same as for IVTPA, except that they mention about the distal occlusion in the ICA and an M1, um, and then um, what, how to proceed in terms of um, workup uh, with imaging. The primary outcome uh, was using the modified ranking scale and looking at the functionality and the independence at 90 day. Um, the secondary endpoints included the early response and recanalization at 24 hours and obtaining a grade 2B or Tiki 3, which is the thrombolysis in cerebral ischemia or infarct. The most important slide is this one. The thrombectomy group, as you can see, how this is the modified ranking scale. Uh, so modified ranking scale 0, 1, 2, or even 3 allows the patient to have some independence. Uh, if that patient was just after a stroke on a modified ranking scale of 5 and you move that patient to a modified ranking scale of 3 or 2, that's significant. Very important. So see the arm from the thrombectomy, how all the, that group of patients was moved to the left to be more functional compared to the control group that was really um, a score of six, means the patient is dead. Uh, and score of five, it would be that patient going to a nursing home, 24 hour care permanently. Um, let me go over that. Safety outcomes, looked at uh, stroke-related death at 90 days and um, procedure-related complications and deterioration within 24 hours. The diffuse three had pretty much similar criteria. They look at patients within 6 to 16 hours and um, their demographic was pretty homogeneous, primary, um, efficacy outcome was about the same as the DON trial. Uh, they looked at uh, symptomatic hemorrhage for safety outcomes, early deterioration. Um, and then the key slide is looking at the endovascular therapy group moving towards the left compared to the medical therapy group. This is um, a rapid CTP, which is a, a perfusion image that obtains slices of um, scan. And then it will show you, oh, sorry. It will show you on the green, this green part is the penumbra area, which is the area that can be reperfused and that we can save, or they can save. I cannot save it, they can save it. Um, and this is the core which is the area of infarct. So if you see that there is a mismatch between the area that we can um, restore that blood flow and this area that probably will suffer permanent damage uh, from an acute stroke. So when there was a mismatch, um, the patients were um, they qualified to go into those trials. Um, so we have now at Virginia Mason um, an acute stroke flow showing that patients within the six hour window, last known normal, uh, we do a stat CT non-contrast and then a CTA. After six to 24 hours, we go straight for HES-CT, CTA, and CT perfusion. And then we go from there to the algorithm. Uh, see if the patient is a thrombectomy candidate, minimize the time that the patient uh, 
has to go immediately to the table to have that vessel open. Um, a couple of words in regards to the management of the patient uh, that is in the hospital that we have to keep in mind that we need to have a stroke units that are specialized. The use of antiplatelet therapy now within 24 hours we have a great variety of medications that we can use. Um, aspirin is the most common one. I want to bring to your attention this um, new study that was published in the New England Journal in July um, this year, and it was the results of the POINT trial when we used dual antiplatelet therapy for patients with a small stroke or TIA, and that patient, those patients um, received maximal um, dose of the medication. Uh, the POINT trial is similar, I don't know if you have heard about the Chinese trial that was um, done um, a few years ago called the CHANCE trial where they use aspirin and Plavix. In the POINT trial they used a loading dose of Plavix at 90 days they saw an increased risk of hemorrhagic transformation or increased risk for other type of hemorrhages. Uh, the maximal efficacy was at 20, 21 days. So if we give dual antiplatelet therapy for 21 days and the maximal benefit at 30 days, we are covering our patients and reducing the risk of having a new stroke. We don't use any more the three months because we don't want our patients to have complications with gastrointestinal hemorrhage. Um, or intracranial. Intracranial was a minimal amount of patients, but the other systemic hemorrhage were more pronounced. So we say 21 days if that patient has a higher risk for bleeding, 30 days would be the optimal, and then they can continue with one antiplatelet therapy alone. I think the increased risk of um, hemorrhage, systemic hemorrhage, was probably related to the loading dose that they had, 600 milligrams. So we may tend to use a 300 milligrams of um, Plavix and then uh, keep them on the dual antiplatelet therapy from there on. Supportive care, um, key point is your patients, they have to protect their airway. You have to keep that oxygen level more than 94%. Uh, blood pressure control for patients who have received IVTPA, they need to be less than 185 over 105 after the TPA. When the patients do not receive TPA, the goals are higher. Uh, these are your goal blood pressure. Avoid hypotension. Do not use hypotonic saline solutions in stroke patients. If you use glucose in a patient with a stroke, you can increase the risk of cytotoxic edema, which is swelling inside the cell, and you can complicate the course of that patient. So no hypotonic salings for those patients. Keep temperature under control. Temperature, if the patient has a temperature more than 38, try to treat them quickly. The blood sugar in the ICU and in the general floor should be between 140, 180 for those who are diabetic. Avoid hypoglycemia. They need to have dysphagia screening by speech therapy, DVT prophylaxis. Always ask your doctors, patient needs heparin subcutaneous, can, they, can you put an order, is there a contraindication or not? Depression screening is important, sometimes is subclinical and the patients, they don't complain if you don't ask them. But if you see a patient that, you know, is not maybe talking that much, and if, you know, family saying something has changed, ask them, how do you feel about that? Do you feel sad? Do you feel depressed? Because if they're starting on a medication for depression, that patient probably will do better when they go for uh, their rehabilitation. There is a study using fluoxetine uh, where the patients are started um, on fluoxetine from the very beginning when they are in the hospital and um, they do much better in the rehabilitation, it is uh, proven. So um, 
check out for any friction on the skin. Um, the patient should be advised or recommended uh, rehabilitation. That's part of the 2018 um, guidelines, all of the above. And do not use antibiotics for patients that have a stroke prophylactically. So you don't put anybody on antibiotic because you think they may have an infection. You have to prove it. If they have an infection, then you treat it. Um, no catheter, no foleys. That increases the risk of uh, associated UTIs. When they are in the ICU, uh, if the patient has a cerebellar infarct, close proximity to the fourth ventricle, risk of hydrocephalus, you need to consider a ventriculostomy. Neurosurgeons will do that. They would do craniectomy if that patient has a cerebral edema, compression, um, risk of herniation, and um, patient at risk. Um, there was this study for hemicraniectomy. Oops. Hemicraniectomies for patients with unilateral um, MCA infarcts is whether they are more than 60 years or less than 60 years. If a patient with um, a stroke has a seizure and is a seizure immediately after the stroke, we think is a um, disturbance in the electrolytes in and out of the neuron. So the sodium potassium pump in that neuron wall in that, at that molecular level is disrupted and then that patient can have metabolic related seizures. If it's a um, seizure way after six months, we think that probably is more of an irritation due to the stroke and those patients would tend to have long-term use of antiepileptic medication in opposition to those who had seizures immediately after uh, the stroke. So takeaway points to um, just wrap up is rapid identification of uh, acute stroke patients using BFAST. You don't need a kidney function test to complete a CTA for acute stroke or send that patient for, a, for an angiogram. Um, we need to have non-con CT and CTAs done at the same time. We have been working with Kiritas, and um, I think we have achieved a good amount of patients getting that workup done. Uh, there is an overwhelming positive um, evidence that patients receiving thrombectomy uh, up to 24 hours, they do better than medical therapy alone. Please refer to the acute ischemic stroke guidelines if you have any doubt about the most recent updated um, information. Thank you.